Good evening, everyone. And guess what? I have a microphone that works. Yay. Um, so take a deep breath, please. Just a moment to transition from that room, which was so full, um, to another full moment. So I have the honor of introducing Bass Track Live, and um, this is the third of the three National Theater Project um, supported works that were some of the instigators for having this convening. So um, this means that I don't have to be on the stage anymore. Um, one of the things that I do in my role as uh, director of theater and um, for the National Theater Project is read presenter reports. For Bass Track Live, there were a lot of them. Um, it's very notable, the reach of this show. It went to 40 cities and worked with vets and families and theater goers, and they all came together. That's really a lot of reports. <laughs> it was by far the longest tour plan that I had to track and um, is perhaps a strong indication of the awareness and impact of the audience, community, military partnerships that we are talking about over this weekend. Um, Base track was performed from Pennsylvania to Nebraska, Kansas to Maine, Florida to Texas. Um, and consistently, presenter and audience members alike had the same comments. Um, I wish more people had seen the show. And this was regardless of whether or not the rooms were packed um, and they couldn't fit any more people into the room. Um, the comments that I read also emphasized on guards' commitment to working with military families and to help making these stories uh, more visible. Uh, Base Track Live is actually the only one of the three uh, National Theater projects that I didn't have the opportunity to see, and really that was because their hectic travel schedule rivaled my own. Um, I'm happy to introduce um, Annie Hamburger and Seth Bockley, who will share more about Base Track Live um, and also lead the case study and discussion after. Hi, everybody. I'm sure Hello. you're tired. Hi. Love that. Um, first, can I just say, I want to, I don't, I missed a lot of today, unfortunately, because we were here teching the show, but um, I just want to make sure we really give a shout out to Nifa and Hal Round. They are so great. <laughs> they do such great, important work um, supporting us all. There come those moments in time that change your life. And they can come up very unexpectedly. And Bass Track is one of those situations. I was invited to a workshop at Juilliard by Ed Billows and Michelle DeBucci. And I wasn't even sure I was going to go. I thought, well, maybe I'll go. I'll go because I have to. And I went and saw this workshop. and. It immediately spoke to me as something I needed to put my energies around. So for those of you who don't know, I started On Guard Arts in 1986 to create site-specific theater in New York City and did a lot of large-scale outdoor work, closing off four square blocks of the Meatpacking District, Wall Street, doing the impossible, working with great artists like Ann Bogard, Chuck Mee, Jonathan Larson, and others ran the theater for 13 years, and then um, went off and became the executive vice president of Disney, founding a global division to bring theater artists into the parks worldwide. And then I came back to New York, and I had to ask myself the question, who am I now? What should I be doing? And what's needed in the world? And for those of you who have been through transitions, I'm sure you know that transitions are when you're in the muck, right? And I saw a bass track, and it was this beautiful, beautiful story about war 
that was nuanced, that had extraordinary music, and that was about a photographer, an extraordinary photographer who was embedded in Afghanistan named Taru Kuyama. And he took these photographs and he created a Facebook page and a website to enable military families to communicate with their loved ones. And then Ed Billows and Michelle Debucci, the composers and the originators of the idea, had taken verbatim text from this website and created this multimedia 20 minute piece that was extraordinary. But we were missing um, one very critical thing, which is a director and a thinker and an innovator and a collaborator. And so I had the good fortune to meet Seth Buckley, who's now been in my life over two productions, because we've also done a show called Wilderness, which is touring. And Seth joined the team. Yes, and uh, as you can tell, Annie's uh, vision is an inspiration, and I came in really not knowing, not knowing Michelle or Ed, the composers, or, or the photography in question, but feeling tasked to find a story to take us through you know, an, an, even, an evening-length work. And we took a documentary theater approach. We sent um, a writer and collaborator, Jason Grote, a, a celebrated playwright and screenwriter, out into, um, into uh, across the United States. He interviewed um, young men who had been part of the particular marine unit that was photographed uh, in Teru Kuyama's original uh, project, Base Track, and followed up with them. And through those interviews, we found a story. And the story is the story of the impact of war on families. And we found one particular interview subject named A.J. Shubai and his wife, now ex-wife, Melissa Shubai. Um, and we ended up uh, creating a, a, you know, a, a documentary theater piece really using their story as kind of the specific off of which to tell a, a more universal story about, uh, about service in the 21st century, about war, about, uh, about trauma, and about relationships and the impact of war uh, on families. Um, but I wanted to share, you know, the, the piece that you're, and, and I'll frame a little bit about uh, of what you're going to see today. But we, we ran into a problem where we started to try to write a play. This is where I think Andy and I started beating our head against the wall going, oh, it feels like we're trying to write a play about AJ and Melissa. And it became like, you know, the miniseries uh, soap opera. And, and it was a mess for a while. And it was a mess. You can all relate to it, I'm sure. Uh, but what, what I realized was that it, it had to start with the music. Uh, and so uh, we created a piece that's very impressionistic and, that, and is almost constructed like an album, going uh, from track to track, song to song, using uh, original, you know, the original music of Michelle and Ed as the kind of spine of the work to tell a far more, uh, again, I hope, kind of impressionistic story, a, a kind of tapestry of what, what this feels like to go through um, this kind of deployment, this kind of service, and this kind of return home afterwards. Uh, one other thing is um, we had two very, very important residencies for the development of the piece. One was the University of Florida Gainesville, and uh, we came down there and did a tech residency. Actors had scripts in their hands. We had 1,500 students come see the work. They all filled out questionnaires. They said, we want to hear more from the families, and so I got on Skype and did Skype interviews with the wives, which we then incorporated into the video design, which you will see. And it made me realize, and I, uh, this was very personal for me, that as a mom, I thought to myself, what would it be like if my son walked in the door and said to me, I'm going to war, mom? And it made me realize that we spend so much time talking about vets, and we spend too little time talking about the people who are waiting for them back home. And it's it, the, the war's impact on mothers and wives and husbands and brothers and sisters. And what are they going through? We don't talk about them enough. And so Base Track really serves to try to talk about the experience of war with the whole family. And then we were fortunate enough to go to Arizona State University, and they were fantastic. We know there's a couple of those folks sitting in the audience here. Um, and then did the world premiere at the University of Texas, Austin, and then as Keita said, um, went to 40 cities around the country. 
Can I, can I just interject to say that one thing, just from a theater making point of view, I want to acknowledge how important it was to have really fully technical residencies. This is a multimedia piece. This is not a new play, right? This is not people sitting around a table reading a script. This is video design and music. As I said, those things needed to lead the work, and, and the work wouldn't have been what it became without um, residencies that really allowed for designers to be present and for real design work to be happening in a, a, in a stage, such as we were able to have at ASU and, and Florida. So what you're going to see is um, some of the music. You're going to, AJ's story is very interesting. So he got married uh, before he was deployed. And while he was deployed, his wife, Melissa, had a baby. And when he was in Afghanistan, he was wounded, and then he had to go back home. For a while, he suffered from PTS or PTSD. Um, now he is doing um, very well. He went to college, and, and we've actually kept in touch. Um, and uh, just one funny thing I do want to say, he came to the opening night of um, the show. As did Melissa. As did Melissa. And AJ was sitting in the audience when Melissa was saying something, and this was all verbatim text, and AJ was going, I didn't say that. I can't believe she said that. <laughs> so it was quite something to have them meet the real performers and um, <laughs> quite wonderful, I must say. Let me just frame just quickly again what you're going to see today, this afternoon. So um, you'll be seeing some of the archival video of the production. And again, the story, uh, the, the spine of the story is the story of, of AJ and Melissa, their marriage, um, and some of their stories you'll, you'll see. You will also see uh, some of the Skype videos that Annie mentioned of, of wives uh, of, this, um, uh, of, of Marines from this, from this unit. And you're going to see bits of the, that archival video of the show uh, interspersed with live music performed by Kenneth Rodriguez. And then we're going to end with uh, the final monologue with a piece performed by Chris Boucher. Thank you. Thank you. Sergeant Logan Fromey, um, with 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, Bravo Company, 2nd Platoon. I'm from Dubois, Indiana. My age is I'm 21. Cool, Perry. I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, my first name is Michael. Father, I'm from, I enlisted in New Purdue, um, Virginia. In, uh, I'm 23 years right old. My name is uh, Lance Gordon James Jones, from Boston, Mass, with 1-8 uh, Bravo so Company. Second my name is uh, H.P. Jackson, uh, uh, Joshua Jackson. It's in my blood. I am a Fleet Marine Force Corpsman. My name is uh, Corporal Sean R. Smith. Uh, I'm a squad. My name is Rob Rain, uh, First uh, Lieutenant. Happy uh, 81. Captain John Campbell, Bravo Company. First Lieutenant Nicholas Viscas, 26 years old. I'm Lance Corporal Richard Gilligan. I'm with 1-8. My name is Justin Chu. I'm Sergeant. Um, I'm Corporal Domingo Alfredo Espinal. I'm on the machine gun. I'm Corporal Gonzalez. My name is Andrew 3 Todd Angel. I'm Second Lieutenant Brothers. I'm Corporal Staff on Kessler. Sorry, Eric. I'm Corporal Jonathan. I'm Alex Jenkins. I'm Corporal from Dallas, Texas. With me. First Tide Eighth Marines. Bravo Company. First Platoon. I'm in third squad, and uh, my billet in the squad is squad point man, as you know. You went on patrol with me yesterday, and I was at the front. Oh, man. Yeah. 
No question about it, man. We're the best. When, you know, when I was in Afghanistan, all I wanted to do was come back to America. But then when I got home to America, there was this empty feeling. And I just wanted to go back to Afghanistan. I could see in his face he wants to talk about it, but he doesn't want to talk about it. So, um, for me, the minute that he got back, he was never the same. So when you think of Marine, what do you think of? You think somebody on the news, right, kicking in doors with a rifle. You don't think of a mechanic or a cook, do you? That's what I wanted to do, man. I wanted to be infantry, so. Base Track was a website where these journalists posted photos and videos of the 1-8 guys. Everyone was following it. And yeah, when you're the girlfriend, yeah, you're important enough to know the Base Track information. But like, when you're married, all the wives have your contact information. Because I had the daughter, all the moms that had kids, it was such a bonding thing for us. And then you meet other wives, and you meet veteran wives who have been through four or five deployments. It was just helpful to have that media there to be able to update you, um, Facebook posts or the website, whatever it may be, just so you knew that, hey, they're okay. I can breathe for a second. In Afghanistan, when you see people's Facebook pages that you're involved in are here in these private little group chats, and they're dropping like flies, you lose sleep. And if the phone rings or if the door knocks, whether it's pest control or the maintenance guy, your heart stops beating, thinking that that's the guy coming to tell you he's not coming back. Uh, one of the wives, I can't remember who it was at this time, I can't remember, it was so long ago, written me a question on Facebook chat and asked me, was it my gonzo? And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, was it your gonzo that was killed? And my jaw just dropped. Which at that point, you are waiting for a phone call from the Marine Corps to tell you that your loved one has passed, or a knock on the door, or some sort of message to get to you to tell you that something has happened to them. Because I got a phone call from him, and the first words out of his mouth were, it wasn't me, I'm okay. They're, they're simple people. And uh, I like it, kind of kind of reminds me of home. Afghanistan, we're more focused on hearts and minds and winning people. They want electricity and they want water. And that's definitely the most important job to winning this war. It looks like uh, someone from the medieval ages. The local people start to recognize you. They start to joke with you, become a lot more familiar with you. Kind of reminds me of, kind of reminds me of, kind of reminds me of home. Yeah, now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down. Don't be looking at me and don't you make a fucking sound, yeah. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down. Don't be looking at me and don't you make a fucking sound here. Yeah. War stories, real talk and real worries and open eyes. Conceive and trust could get blurry after all the dirt we cleaned. Their hands were still dirty. They up and ran away. Now here's a friend I gotta bury. Uh, war stories, outlaws with no glory outside. They trade your trushes as soon as they get to know you. I never go out, go a new route, forever hold out. My trust is sold out in any amount, no doubt. Yeah, now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down. Don't be looking at me, and don't you make a fucking sound, yeah. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down. Don't be looking at me, and don't you make a fucking sound. I had a lot of fun with the people at first. You see, they live in dirt huts, uh, literally houses made of dirt. It's like you open up the Bible, and if there was a picture, that's what you'd imagine seeing. There's two different types of stress out there. There's the stress of actually operating, you know, you're constantly on guard and stuff like that. And there's the other stress of you're running patrols, but nothing's happening. 
You know, they say you age faster in the military for a lot of reasons. One of them, you get to the point for us, you know, when Hernandez got killed, when the staff sergeant got killed, it was like, I pray these guys shoot at us. If I ever believe in God, I do now. God, just give me one thing. Let these people shoot at us. You know, you just, you want to do it. Yeah, listen to me, paranoid, deployed man His mind alone is like a war zone he can't stand So listen to me, face sweaty and full of sand Thinking this'll be the day he's lending out his last hand Oh, listen to me, a foggy glass we try and see through Though these people smile, doesn't mean they are happy When they see you change your plans This main's terrain's getting gully Keep a couple feet back and put your eyes down Homie, come on, now put your eyes down Keep two eyes down, son, now put your Put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down. Don't be looking at me, and don't you make a fucking sound, yeah. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down, son. Now put your eyes down, keep two eyes down. Don't be looking at me, and don't you make a fucking sound. Yeah. Got a baby girl on the way. I plan to attend college. I'm going back to uh, going back to school. I'm trying to go back to school. Try to be a firefighter back home in Boston. Kind of thinking about getting out, uh, just going to college, maybe for like a criminal justice degree or something like that. If that if that doesn't work out for me, I'm just gonna try to be like a cop or work for the FBI or something like that. I was going like 90 miles an hour down this side street, like was. Cop cars were a lot quicker than I thought they were, and he caught up to me, and I was like, well, I'm already going to jail, I might as well pull over. So he walked up to me, and he's like, where are you going? I was like, nowhere fast. Give my license and registration and everything. He's like, have you been drinking tonight? Yeah. He's like, think you pass a breathalyzer or a field sobriety test? No, go ahead and take me to jail. He's like, all right, okay, I'll be back in a minute. So he comes back, and he's like, I see you were in the Marines, huh? I was like, yeah. He's like, what'd you do? I said, I was in the infantry. He's like, oh, did you deploy to Afghanistan or anywhere? Did you see any combat? I said, yeah, I just got back from Afghanistan in March. He's like, okay. He's like, well, step out of the car. <laughs> All right, here we go. And he's just like, he's like, do you have PTSD? I was like, well, I'm not been officially diagnosed with it, but I'm pretty sure that I haven't. He's like, you can't keep doing this. He's like, you need to fix yourself, you know, and get your life right. day is worse and worse and worse to the point that the fan would blow the curtains and he would think in his sleep that he would put his arm on me, draw his gun, and get ready to shoot the damn window. I'm like, if I scare him, it'll go off. If, if I try and stop him, it's gonna go off. If I don't try and stop him, it's gonna go off. AJ, you're asleep. That's the fan. You need to understand I'm right here. You've got to wake up. You're using the wrong resources to get better. You're going the destructive route. someone to go to war and come back the same way they were it's like he's more short-tempered but it's not like terrible but it's just small changes that maybe only I would notice you really have to be careful what you say and how you present things um, you know like I said that innocence is gone their whole way of thinking is completely different over there and it just affects how they respond to you when they come home uh, we were told by a few different people, like, if they're having a nightmare and you have to wake them up, don't be anywhere close to their face. He was having a nightmare, and I went to wake him up, and I touched the bottom of his foot, and he just, I didn't think, like, when I thought they meant jump, 
that he was just gonna, you know, like go like this and startle awake, how some people do. But he sat straight up, like he jumped up and was out of breath. You know, I that blew my mind because I just that was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. It, it takes a toll. I mean, they're they're young guys. It it you know they're not supposed to be going through all this. Their brain is not really equipped to do this. It's not how they were raised. So, you know, to go do things like this, it's, it's really confusing for them. These guys are taught to go and kill. They're, they're trained to, to do that, to kill their enemy. You know, and they're, you know, they're taught that it's good to do that. They're, they eat, sleep, breathe, and pray it. You know, and they come home and they know that they're not supposed to do those things, obviously, at home. They know that. They know right from wrong. But that kill switch is on. How, how, how do you turn that off? We tried to go to uh, couples counseling, you know, but we just brought up the past and how we hated each other and how there was no fixing things. So, so I left. And I was like... Uh, shit. Like, I have nothing. You know? I know what's ahead of me. You know, it's just going to get worse. I'm never going to get rid of this. So, I was like, you know, what the hell with this? I was, I was about to kill myself. I, w I was done. But then, I was thinking, and I uh, thought that, uh, that I wanted, um, my daughter, obviously. Um, so my buddy Johnson, I, I had his shit. You know, I had uh, some of his pictures amongst my shit. And uh, on his memorial booklet, he had this, like, blues picture. And, and it was like it was scowling at me, you know? Like, what are you doing? And I thought to myself, you know what? This is some shitty-ass way to repay my friend for dying for me. So I went to the hospital and uh, checked myself in. exposure therapy it's where they uh they sit you down and they almost like uh, like hypnotize you and you tell uh, so you see you uh you you close your eyes and they blacken the room and then you tell your story you know of like a traumatic event or whatever um or from the first person like as you're doing it i mean it's almost like you're uh, oh it's like uh, the matrix almost you know if you think about that scene whenever neo's like oh, i need guns and like all of a sudden the guns just you know show up. Or he's he's like, I need to be here, and everything just sort of falls. So um your eyes are closed and you're just telling it, and uh and you always start from the very same spot. The first couple of times I did it, you know, my eyes are closed and, and she asks, um, so where are you? And I said, uh, I'm on my base in Afghanistan. And she says, uh, what do you smell? And I said, I, I smell shit. He says, uh, well, what time is it? I said, well, I'm, I'm on my truck, just uh, kicking my boots, just killing time, waiting on my boys to wake up because it's time to go. He says, well, how do you feel? And I swear to God, like, I can just see the moon, you know? It's like, it's like late November, and I'm cold, and I can literally see my breath coming off. I'm like, oh, my God, are you serious? Man, it's kind of cool. But then... Then you start getting into the bad shit, you know, and then it sucks. So, um, so you're sitting there and you're, you're just telling it and, uh, you're forced to tell this same story just like over and over and over and over again. And, and the idea is that like, like, like if you have a scab and you rip it off, you know, the very first time you do it, it hurts like a son of a bitch. And the second time it hurts like a son of a bitch, but then it's not so bad. You know, then it's not so bad, and then it, it just doesn't hurt anymore. You know, that, then it's just skin. I mean, you might have a little scar, you know, but whatever. Yeah, it, it worked. I mean, it literally saved my life. But then Melissa left me, and uh, I went and I, I saw my doctor again. And I go in there, and I'm telling her, you know, that uh, my wife just, like, left me left me. I'm like, this is over. You know, my, my life is over. You know, blah, 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 blah. 
And uh, she's just smiling at me the whole time. And I, and I look at her and I'm like, what do you think is so great that you have to smile about? And she goes, well, you don't see it yet, but you started this because of her. And I was like, yeah, because I wanted to get better, you know, for my family. And she says, all right, well, you know, she broke up with you. She dumped you. I'm like, yeah. She says, well, are you at a bar right now getting drunk? No. You came in to see me. It just hit me. You know, I was, I was like, oh, shit. She's right. And then I, I started telling her all these things, you know, that, that I'd been, uh, like, running away from, the things I didn't want to talk about, the shit I just kept bottled up. And then all of a sudden, it just it wasn't a big deal anymore. Because, I mean, yeah, you might have a little scar, you know, but uh, it's just skin. I think we need one more. No, we're good on church. Hi. So given that um, we went to 40 cities around the country, um, we wanted to talk about some of the wonderful things that happen and some of the things that could be improved upon um, in our partnerships with presenters. I did want to just um, briefly summarize our developmental process from an engagement point of view. Um, you all have had the good fortune to meet Art de Grout. Um, and I consider myself in that uh, fan club. And um, one of the things I'm finding as I'm doing this social justice work is that it is a rare bird who's not in the arts and who doesn't have a lot of exposure to the arts who really gets the power of the arts to impact social change. And when you meet that person, you hold on to them for dear life. And so Art, who's the Director of Military Affairs of Kansas State, and I got on the phone when we were talking about going to Kansas State, and we became fast friends. And since then, he has been a tireless advocate for a base track, uh, working very closely with presenters and giving us tremendous validity within the military community, as well as being a real guide for presenters to help them to connect with their communities. So would you like to? Yeah, well, I, it, was a, it was an honor to be a part of this uh, and still be a part of the base track. Um, I made a list of some of the things, the tasks, and again, these were all novel things that I had really never done before. Uh, I got involved in the creative process. There was an issue uh, with the script, the final script, because uh, veterans demand accuracy and a script, but a non-veteran audience would, would lose the story. And, and so I worked with the, with the team uh, uh, and tried to broker 
how much uh, accuracy in military jargon was important uh, without losing the civilian audience. Uh, I got involved in, uh, in helping the presenter. I got involved with a engaging the veterans organizations as a fellow veteran uh, and asking them to gather comfort zone and go to the theater and support this work and the people that do this work. Uh, I got involved in fundraising. Uh, I, I actually took some, some behavioral science research and, and, and found a evidence-based approach to why this work uh, is not just art, it's, uh, it's, it's, it promotes well-being and, uh, and civic understanding. So, so I provided some empirical basis that this work is grounded in, uh, in good science. Um, so those were some of the th marketing and promotion, um, outreach programs, uh, and the 2016 tour. I got to go to six cities and do the talkbacks on stage. Uh, got to organize and participate with Ann in some of the uh, public engagements, uh, particularly veteran students on college campuses that had theaters. Um, that was very rewarding. So we, we touched probably 300 people before we ever got on stage. Um, so those were some of the things, uh, la laundry list of others that I was involved with, and, and I think that was impactful, and uh, I want to do this more, so. So Chris uh, went to um, the 15 cities. He's, uh, the actor who was in the film was a different, a different uh, actor um, and veteran, and uh, Chris took over for him. Um, but I would like this to be very interactive rather than us doing a lot of talking. And I know that, I, I'm presuming that it's safe to say that every person in here really deeply cares about the world and using the arts for social change. So I, and there's a lot of really, really smart people in here and it's really hard work, um, as we know. Um, it was hard for us to get audiences. Um, some places we were more successful than others. Uh, one of my favorite moments was when 750 high school students came into Royce Hall in, U in LA, and I asked everyone how many of the students had um, loved ones who'd been in the service, and three quarters of them raised their hands. And then I said, how many of you have those loved ones that are willing to talk about it? And almost no one raised their hands. So those are the kinds of moments that keep you going. Um, but I wanted to do a little exercise. Um, and the exercise is, for all of you and for us, I'm going to start it. And it, I'm going to start it with a sentence that says, I wish I could, with regard to engagement um, and bringing these kinds of shows to your uh, theaters. So I'll start it. And then I'd like you all to, to um, continue. Um, for me, it would be, I wish I could stay longer in a city to develop relationships more fully. You were able to convey exposure therapy so well. Uh, it's a brutal treatment. Um, the fact that you also engage the matrix analogy, we use it very often with our soldiers. They've stepped outside the box, and now we're asking them to come back in. How do they do that? So the, the metaphor is beautiful, and uh, it was just very powerful, and uh, I wish I could get you to Fort Hood. We can talk. Well, uh, as, a, as a fellow Texan, I, I wish I could have brought you to uh, Dallas, Texas. Um, I think one of the... It was early in my tenure at uh, SMU, and, and we were talking to APAC about co-presenting. And I think at the time, uh, APAC's mind frame was still very transactional, so it quickly boiled down to audience and the ability to sell tickets, right? Um, and the time that would take, there wasn't, uh, I don't know if they ever had a chance to talk to you, Mr. DeGro, about you know, the things that you can do, uh, but I don't even know if they were open to it at the time. So, you know, that, that I think has since changed a little bit, but that's my answer to your prompt. I wish I could help you, Base Track, help us, Carpet Bag, Speed Kill My Cousin, help them help us all. I, I'd like to, um Thank you for your compliments, but I'd love to hear tactically and strategically how one um, might make a difference in terms of 
um, trying to shake loose the tree a little bit with making these kinds of shows happen beyond bass tracks. Um, I loved your show, by the way, yesterday. It was beautiful. So I'm going to answer the wish thing. This is Madison. I wish um, that I could translate better, because I think a lot of this is about translating from one field to another field. Um, I will bring you to Atlanta, because um, I think it's important to have not only this work, but these kinds of works. And I think tactically, um, what I'm getting out of and feeding back from the group is um, that we do need more time. And we need to figure out ways, and to, to Susie's question earlier, what can we do, where do we need help, where are the gaps? I think the gaps are in um, multiple trips to Atlanta to, to uh, with multiple bodies in the room, not just me, not just you, but Art and others, and we go as a collective to um, partners and funders, and we start a conversation um, years before a show ever appears. So um, that's something that I've been trying to set up, but would love to continue that conversation. Yeah. Actually, um, so it's funny, the way that I got connected to, to uh, Bass Track actually was through a, a kind of a, a business pursuit. I was working with um, Bedlam in, in New York, but it was actually because of a uh, something I was developing to try and connect audiences and here. And the thing that I've learned through going through this process with them, because uh, I'm still very new to the arts, uh, was kind of the production source. The, the, we, we look, I think, at the arts and as we can try and connect to audiences, and there's the fiscal component and there's the artistic and, and uh, social justice component. The problem is I think we try and do everything on the tail end. Like you front load all the effort and the cost and the expenditures on the front end, and um, then you only start reaching out kind of towards the tail end right there. And the problem with that is that it lends itself to a distribution model, which we don't have. We are in a theater. We have to bring people to the product. You can't really export the product the same way you can a movie or a show. That's not what we're selling. That's not what we're doing. Um, in the front load, there is so much value. So you made a comment. I've, you are the first person, because I've been trying to push this as an idea for a long time, and thank you, sweet Jesus for being someone who say that because there's no reason we shouldn't be opening up this part of the process. Where, we as artists, where do we find the real, the real long-term satisfaction? It's in that creation. And there is value there. If we perceive the value and feel it, I promise you the audience will too. Why aren't we inviting audiences in to watch our rehearsals? I understand safe space. I've heard it. But a certain gentleman by the name of Mike Pence argued that there, or Trump on his behalf, argued that there should be a safe space. And we all said, uh, fuck that. It's not a safe space. So why are we holding our audiences to a different standard than we hold ourselves? We should be opening up the audition process, the rehearsal process, the writing process. Everything should be an opportunity beforehand. And as it takes a year or two to open these things up, you can start developing interest, and you can start developing word of mouth marketing. You can start developing an audience before there's even a product, and they will see you, and they will see what you are doing, see the genuineness, and bring it in there. So as far as tactical, too. And in the end, this is the part I hate to say, because as artists, we all know that we are giving 100%, but the simple fact of the matter is, we need to give more. And at the end of the show, I know you're wasted, I know it's incredibly exhausting, but you have to be willing to have, why isn't every show doing a talk back like this? You have to be then willing to talk about all the emotion you just left gunshot splattered on the floor and explain it to people because they might not understand it. They might not get it. They need that translation to get there. And we not once did we have a talk back session that petered out naturally. We had to shut down every talkback session because everyone was so ridiculously engaged and wanting to talk about it. And the audiences want that because that's what differentiates us. We're not a screen. You can actually talk. I can't ever talk to Brad Pitt or Samuel Jackson on the screen and be like, what was it like making that movie? They can do that and they want to do that. We have to let them do that. Yeah, I'll give you a little list. We, we talked about the purpose of veterans, presenting veterans are creating it for, for civic literacy on understanding veterans. Here's just a quick list of the issues that were in base track that we, that we brought into discussion in the community. AJ's decision to join the military. Insights into relationships between young service members and their significant others and families. Resocialization and institutionalization into the unique socioculture of the military. 
social bonding with new military peers uh, through depths of connections, Marines and their spouses. Witness high-risk pregnancy confounded by combat deployment of the father. We see a first war in contemporary social in the social network culture, uh, where they're co-present in both because of Facebook, social media on the battlefield. First generation to be co-present on the home front and the battlefront, the war front at the same time. AJ's experience in actual modern combat, uh, IEDs and firefights in Afghanistan is a new way of war. Living through loss and reporting of loss of comrades, new way of reporting that for this generation. Coming home is a good and a bad thing. Wounded, psychological impacts of rapid departure from the unit. Confronting life-changing transitions out of the military after being highly bonded, invested, and identified. Nature of departure is lived with confounding presence of PTSD. Issue a personal path towards destruction of untreated PTSD. Motivation to be treated and outcomes of adequate treatment. Those were the issues that came out mostly from the audience, uh, inspired by these themes that were addressed beautifully and appropriately uh, in, the pres in the art. And um, Anne Colleen, one of the things I wish for you, we had an amazing experience, and I wish that we all who are in the presenting field can lend our credibility to your work, to Carpet Bag, to Hold Them Down, to all of this work to say, not only is it important in engaging and connecting our communities, but it's just plain great theater. And I think more people will take a chance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colleen. It, you know, one, one thing I um, just want to answer Andy's question, I, I wish we could. And I want to answer that question from a pedagogical point of view. I'm a, I'm a teacher um, and work, I work in higher education. and. Uh, I know that many of the presenters are affiliated with um, institutions of higher education, and I wish we could integrate the arts into the educational experience holistically. And it speaks to, I think, what Chris is saying about involving students so that, so that art is not this pedestal, it's not, up, it's not this weird thing that the artsy students do. It's, not, um, it, it's, it's actually part of, it's part of your overall uh, uh, educational experience um, uh, as in a liberal arts institution, you know, and I was inspired. I w we were really inspired, I think, by by what happened at University of Florida. Which, if you don't know, as Annie said, um, I think earlier in our introduction, we we had the tremendous fortune of bringing in you know, hundreds of uh, first year undergraduates who were essentially required to come and see our work in progress showing. And this, this program called the Good Life Program, it's a, sort of a, a program over the summer that allows incoming freshmen to um, study like works of philosophy and ask these like big questions about what am I doing with my life and what does one do with one's life? What is the good life? Um, I found that really inspiring, not only because students are asking big questions at, you know, at a, at a, mostly at, a, at a quite a young age and, um, uh, and some include uh, veterans who are coming in to the university system after their deployments and after their service. Um, but, you know, the fact that the arts was just part of that course and that attending it was simply and kind of casually integrated into that curriculum, I found really inspiring. And it made me think that a big part of the solution to, I don't know, I think, I think bringing more, more folks into a work like this is to embed it more carefully and deeply into um, educational programming and academic programming. Ramon Baca exit. Oh. I um, do. I do I just want to say one thing, which is that um, Michael Blatchley told me that the reason he was able to do this program was because he had support at the very highest echelons of the school. It was the president of the school who signed on for this. And it would, I wish we could get to all the presidents. <laughs> Go ahead, Ramon. Ramon Baca, Exit 12 Dance Company. And I, I want to echo a lot of what you've been saying. Um, Exit 12 has the same, uh, same, similar issues. When we, our audiences say, why isn't everybody seeing this? But then we have good, on, got a good audiences in some places we go and then mediocre audiences in other places. But the places where we have the most success are where we have, we went to Stanford University and we had a similar engagement with a freshman class that was an arts immersion class. They brought in students from every discipline to experience the arts in, and they lived together, they ate together, they took a diversity of uh, classes together, and it was all centered around the arts. We did a workshop with them in the morning, and then they came, they wanted to come and see the performance. Um, and so I wish that uh, more presenters would help us with the legwork to get those things happening in order to bring more people to the, see the work. That was really surprising to me when we did this, that 
I, what I found out is not having done, this was my first gig at like this level of the game and whatnot, was that I found out that like you have to rely on the venues when you're touring to do that. And but I do want to say, uh, so just I'm curious, uh, how many presenters are in the room? Would you raise your hands? And how many of you feel like you have the time and the resources to do the advanced legwork that you need to do for these kinds of shows? So Anne, could I, this is Liz, could I, could I speak to this for just a minute? And uh, just, I really want to respond to Chris's, your, your articulation of process as being an engagement necessity that came from what Madison said. Mm -hmm. It's what I was attempting to say yesterday, but I also have a slight cautionary tale here. And that is if you truly flip the hierarchy, you cannot privilege the end performance to the engagement activities that are taking place. So what we want to understand is that you do the engagement because, well, because art matters. <laughs> because, th because these stories matter, because connecting to my neighborhood school or the person in prison or wherever I've gone matters. And yes, working alongside people like Colleen and Michael and other, and other presenters here, yes, this may accumulate to audience at our performance. But likely as not, that's because they've gotten to know us. Not, I, I, I mean, it's because we connected, because something happened. Uh, and yes, because they are in these amazing programs that some schools are putting in place. So I just, um, it isn't only about that. And I, the reason I raise it as cautionary is that I believe if we make it be about that, there's a, there's a slight feeling of exploitation. I, not really, but there's some way that it comes off not quite entirely there. And I have to just say, I, uh, having done engagement work my entire life, I, uh, I've only learned this by experience. And by the times I didn't do that, and I thought it was about the, getting people to the show. And I'm not sure. I'm just not sure about that. So happy to hear more people I'm talking about I'm that. I'm sorry, I'm curious. I don't, I don't think I caught what you picked up what you were laying down. It, I'm just it, it just that it can't only be that we're doing engagement so that people will come see us when we come back and do our big show. Oh, no. Uh, no, you do it because what you want, just like Simon Sinek would, would say, um, there's a go, Simon Sinek Golden Circle, YouTube it, it's a fantastic video. Um, you, you don't say, look, my goal is to get people here. The place it's got to come from is I'm engaging people so that they can better appreciate the artistic process and they can better connect with or this we message. Hear them better and we'll oh yeah, see absolutely. No, it's better. definitely a two-way uh, definitely a two-way street. So yeah, you don't do it in order to fill seats. Filling seats is a side effect. Just like you don't you or hopefully ideally you don't do a job so you make money. You do a job you love and a side effect is that well, you make money. I'm not money. sure I agree with either of you totally actually. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> um, but uh, with all due respect cuz I think you do beautiful work, but um, uh, I am an artist. I'm not a social worker. Um, I don't run a social service organization. I'm not a PTS expert. I'm not a military expert. The way in which I have chosen to reach out and try to impact the world is through my work. I spent two years interviewing vets. This piece is comprised of verbatim text. I have worked with pres the presenters as successfully as possible in trying to engage the community I can only do so much as the fact that I'm not a permanent member of that community. The presenters are. And where the presenters, I think, have more funding, more staffing, they can create kind of ongoing programs. But for me, the, uh, the way I feel, and I also don't feel like there's one right way to do things, the work is what I give to my audience and hopefully working with people like Art and the people who are the presenters being successful, um, what do you say, kind of givers of that work or um, hosts of that work, it can be a meaningful experience. I mean, that's I don't think that runs view. counter to what but, was said. I don't uh, think that's a contrary Michael? statement. Michael? Or no, some actually, <laughs> I'm going to take us off track for a second. I first wanted to, the trumpeter rap artist behind the table, you are such a badass. I mean, that was awesome. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> I also just wanted to address the comment that you made about bringing art back into school. Um, I actually feel very strongly about 
that comment as well, partially because I have six children, and so I've seen kind of along the way where they start to learn um, or start to think that they're not artists anymore. But just the idea of bringing it back in, right? So at work, you know, we have yoga therapists, and one of the key things that they do is really work with the breath. They don't bring the breath in. They acknowledge the breath that's already there that we're using all the time. I feel like art is the same thing. It's there all the time. You don't need to bring it. It's there. You just need to acknowledge it. So. And this is going to be the last question from, or comment from Michelle. I, yes. I, I would like to just say on the educational component and the resource component, has there been any thought of possibly um, putting together a virtual production? You know, we see this as a multimedia work, but it's a live performance, and artists like Chris and Kenny, you know, this is, um, this is the intention of the work. You know, um, for, for me, it, it, this piece at least, um, uh, at its heart is a, is a theater work, and what I mean by that is simply that it's about human beings together in a room hearing uh, a story told by other human beings. So for me, the human element, as it were, cannot be reduced away. Um, that's, that's my take. Um, as a theater artist, um, I feel that live music and, and live acting is, um, is essential. Um, yeah. I'd just like to conclude by thanking everyone who participated and um, to just say that, you know, at the center of this work and every work that I do is about crossing the divide and really trying to get out of the echo chamber that so much of our work is in, unfortunately. And, and I went to a mental health conference last April about, for wilderness, and I asked the therapists in the room how many of them have ever heard of documentary theater, and not one person raised their hand. So to me, that is what is the greatest urgency, is how to jump the fence and reach across the divide. I know hope we can all support one another in trying to do that in our own ways. So thank you.